I've been working on chronic wasting disease for 15 years. Uh, our goal has been to try to understand the disease and how it works and try to see if we could develop some management strategies to, to do something about the disease. So we do really pretty much applied uh, kinds of research. So I think it's, it's good to start out with prions a little bit. Um, prions are a very unusual thing for us disease guys. They're, they're not a virus, they're not a bacteria, they're just a protein. And so it's kind of weird that we have something that's just a protein that causes a disease, but it does. Now, prions, we all have, all mammals have prions, and they have, we have what we call normal prions. And they perform some function in our body that we're not really sure. Science really isn't really sure exactly what they do or why they're there. But we know they're pretty important because there's a sort of a conserved genetic structure that uh, produces them throughout the animal kingdom pretty much, or mammals. So we know they're important, and we know that they, um, they do things in the body, um, but they don't live very long in the body. They have a very short half-life. They get degraded by protease K. They're very readily, de readily degraded. Um, and so they just sort of go around and do their thing and then just disappear. But the problem occurs when some of them become misfolded. And when they become misfolded, the body can't get rid of them. In addition to that, they're misfolded in the, in the shape that's very similar to the prions um, that the body has normally. And so they're not recognized as a foreign substance, and the body doesn't do anything to fight against them. There's no immune response or anything like that. So that's sort of then the origin of this disease. But initially, when this disease was discovered in Wisconsin, there was a, we sort of thought that this was what we call a density-dependent disease. In other words, if we reduce the number of deer, we could reduce the number of deer that were infected, and then that, that would actually cause us to get rid of the disease, in theory. And what we've discovered since is it's not really a density-dependent disease. It's what we call a frequency-dependent disease. And that means that it's not the density of infected deer that drive, the, drive infection. It's actually the prevalence of the disease. So the other thing we worry about, of course, is what the impact of this disease has on our deer and what it means for things like hunting, recreational hunting, and the deer population. So there's been four studies done, completed in the West now, and there's a study that's starting up um, down in southeast or south central Wisconsin this year, with the DNR study, to look at the effect of the disease on our deer populations. The four studies in the West um, have all concluded that when CWD gets to a high enough level of prevalence, particularly in the females, because that's the animals, those are the animals that are producing fawns. Um, when the pre prevalence gets high enough, then basically re we see reductions in the deer population. So in some of those populations, they've actually had to reduce the amount of hunting pressure that those populations can withstand, and they've actually had to back off quite a bit on hunting of adult, adult bucks in particular. And pretty much in some of the mule deer populations, their trophy animals are pretty much gone. What about human consumption? We know, for example, that mad cow went from cows to people. The chances of that happening were quite rare, but yet the consequences were very serious. And the science really isn't very complete. We don't make people guinea pigs and feed them infected deer. Some people volunteer to do that, um, but we don't do that intentionally and we don't monitor them. So we don't really have good science. We have to do other studies. We, so we, we, we feed primates, which sort of come up with mixed results, and we do a lot of laboratory studies. So I think most people who study this pretty hard would conclude that the risk of humans getting infected is pretty low, but we can't say it's zero at this point. How close are we to being able to test a live deer for CWD? We can test live deer. It's not easy. The, the best test we have is basically on dead animals. Um, the lymph nodes seem to be... Lymph nodes at brain material are the best tests we currently have. So if you harvest a deer and it's tested, um, typically what they'll do is they'll take out what are called the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which are the ones that are right here. If you get a cold or something, fill underneath your jaw, and when those things get swollen up, that's, that's your retropharyngeal lymph nodes. Pull those out of deer, and they're probably infected um, within maybe four to six months. So fairly early in the cycle. 
But that's pretty much something you can't do on a live deer. You can't remove their lymph nodes. So what do we do for live deer? Um, we can take a tonsil biopsy. So you reach down their throat and pull off a piece of their tonsil. If you get enough of the tonsil, then you can look at it under a microscope and see if they're infected. Or we can do what's called a rectal biopsy. and take. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's some lymph nodes in the rectum that they can remove and test, and that seems to be a little less reliable than tonsils. Um, and uh, another procedure. But none of these things are simple. They all involve capturing deer. What, what we really need is some kind of a, what I like to call as a dipstick test, is where a hunter could take it out and take a drop of blood and, you know, a little litmus paper test and say, oh, this animal's infected, this animal's in. We're a long way from anything like that. How hopeful are you for the future that we may be able to manage this disease in the next, you know, 10, 20 years? Unless we can find a silver bullet, I think it's going to be tough. So a silver bullet like a vaccine that we can easily distribute or something like that. I'm not aware of any solutions that are not extraordinarily painful for hunters. Um, and that's why, you know, it's been very hard to get the hunting public to, to buy into doing something about CWD. And so the, the problem, as I see it, is we have a long-term problem of we're either going to have to figure out how to control this disease and how to manage it, or it's going to begin to affect our deer herds, and we're going to, we're going to have some pain on the hunting side that, in, in that respect as well. We're going to have a lot of infected deer on the landscape. We think that probably within five years or a little much longer, we're going to have most of the areas in southern Wisconsin where, it's, where it sort of originated, what we call the core area, where we're going to hit probably prevalences of 40 to 50 percent in males. We have some areas now in Iowa County that have gotten to that stage already, and probably 25 to 30 percent in females. And at that point, we're going to begin to see impacts on the herd. And then most of the animals that people are going to be shooting are going to be infected, and you have to make these decisions about, do you ignore that? Do you consume it? What do you do? Um, so I'm, I have to be honest, given the, the climate, I think in terms of you know, wanting to do something, I'm not real optimistic um, that, uh, in terms of managing this disease in Wisconsin, southern Wisconsin in particular. My optimism is right now that many states who have sort of ignored this problem for a while and hoped it would go away are now beginning to realize it's not going to go away and it's going to be a big problem. <laughs>